of Katarina Stroppel, a representation theory and categorification. So today she's going to tell us about their grammatical categories as universal monodic categories. Please, Katarina. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, yesterday we uh, talked a little bit about monoidal categories, which I wanted to sell as a categorification of monoids. Uh, and today I want to give you examples, more examples of nice uh, monoidal categories. So many nice examples of monoidal categories. And I want to say of strict monoidal categories. So what does strict mean? Strict means uh, this associator map, which we gave in the data, associator and the unit map. So this was called, I think, A and I, uh, are just the identity maps. So they are the easiest things you can imagine. Uh, so these categories are given uh, often by uh, diagrammatical categories. And today I want to explain some of them. and give at least one application of these guys. So let's start with uh, continuing from yesterday. So given a field K, which I fix, and I take delta, an element in K, I define now more properly what I mean by temporally leap depending on delta. So yesterday I, I only defined a temporally leap depending on one which was a, maybe a funny definition. Today, I was, want to make it dependent on delta. Delta is any element in the field. Uh, and it's defined exactly as yesterday as the linear category where objects are natural numbers, including zero. And the morphisms, so Holmes from A to B in this category, is just the, the K vector space k-vector space with spaces crossing this matrix. From A to B. So you might wonder what is different to yesterday. So far, nothing is different, absolutely nothing. But the difference comes in when we compose. And the composition is concatenation. as yesterday, so I put the second thing on top of the first, and then I replace the internal circles uh, by a factor delta. So yesterday I just ignored them, which meant I had a factor one, and now I put in this factor delta. Uh, so here are some examples. Uh, so for instance, when I want to, to compose this one with that one, I put the second on top of the first, so I just write it here. But now I have these two inter internal circles, so each of them gives a delta, so I get a delta squared times the diagram, which is the rest. Or if you, if you put, for instance, this cup uh, and you compose it with this cap, you put the cap on top of the cup and you just look at the, uh, at the corresponding picture of connections causing this matchings, you just get the identity. And also when I do it, the cup on the left and the cap on the right, I again get such a, a picture, uh, which is the identity. And so this is, I want to, want to call them the beautiful snakes. So you will see them later again and should remember. And so isn't, here's another example of a composition. When I take uh, this cup and cap uh, and compose with, or cap and cup, compose with itself, then again, I stuck the second on top of the first, I get this internal circle and I get a bit. Okay, so, um, and of course, uh, one question was asked, of course, this home space is always just uh, the zero vector space if A plus B is not an even number, because then I cannot find any crossing this matching. Okay, good. So now a few remarks. So one remark is, uh, that the endomorphism ring in this category of an object A is an algebra, obviously. And this is often called a temporally leap algebra, or usually called a temporally leap algebra, TLA data. 
and this is often studied. Uh, so we glue somehow all these temporal leave algebras together in one category. And the other remark I wanted to make is that the size somehow of TL delta of the home spaces, for instance, and the basis, the basis of homes is independent of delta. Uh, but uh, the multiplication not, or composition is not. And also the, the behavior is not. So I just want to give you one, one uh, small example to show you the difference or some differences. So for instance, like, let's look at the case, I want to assume delta is not zero. Uh, and let's look at the endomorphism ring in this temporal leap category of the object two. So in this case, I claim the endomorphism algebra is just k times k. So what kind of, of elements do I have in this endomorphism? I, of course, have the identity. So if you believe in that it's isomorphic to k times k, I should map the identity to 1, 1. And then I can take the element which is given by the cup and the cap. And uh, you can easily check these are all the two possible, uh, all possible uh, crossingness matchings from two points to two points. So this is a basis of my endomorphism algebra. So now I look back at this formula upstairs. When I multiply this guy with itself, I get delta times this thing. So which means when I divide by delta here, then this is an idempotent. And so I can map this, for instance, to 1, 0. And so the claim is that uh, uh, the image of 0, 1, which is, of course, the difference of the two things, which would be 1 minus 1 delta, this is also an idempotent. This is an idempotent. Uh, because let's just check it. This guy uh, squared. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I don't check this, but what I check is um, so this is an item important. I let you, you check this, but it's it's orthogonal to this other guy. So let's check this. So if I multiply these two guys to, together, I get one divided by delta times this cup cap minus one divided by delta squared times this cup cap composed with cup cap. So I remove the circle, I make a delta out of it. So what I get is one divided by delta cup cap minus one divided by delta cup cap is zero. So I get that these two guys are idempotents, which are powerwise orthogonal. And so uh, I can map them to one zero respectively zero one. And I uh, can check that this is an isomorphism of edges. So this is an isomorphism. or it defines an isomorphism of algebra because I tell you what it does on a basis. So now let's take as a comparison delta to be zero. And in this case, I claim that this endomorphism algebra looks quite different. So of course the size is the same. Again, I have two basis vectors, the identity and cup cap. But I claim in this case, the algebra is looking like CX modulo X squared. So a truncated polynomial ring. And why is this the case? So I have the element one in this truncated polynomial ring. This goes to the identity, two strands. And now if I look back at my relation, the cup cap multiplied with itself is delta times the cup cap. But if delta is zero, then this is zero. So that means the cup cap is squaring to zero. And so this is exactly what I force here in my relation. So that means X, I can send X to cup cap. And then you can easily check that all the relations work. Uh, so this is again an algebra. I don't know. And now what you what you uh, see is in the first case I just have two copies of a field. So this is a very nice, easy example of a product of matrix algebras. So the first thing is by Artin Wedderburn. This is a semi-simple algebra. And in the second case, this is not semi simple. Uh, so, for instance, uh, in the warm up session on Sunday, we, we had that kx modulo x squared is indecomposable, but it's not irreducible. And this cannot work if we are in a semi simple world. 
Of course, it's not semi-simple. So that means what we see here already in this very small example is that this temporary leap categories, if I define them properly like today with this very delta, uh, interpolates in some sense between the semi-simple world uh, and the non-semi-simple world. Let me just write between these two situations. So you can vary your delta slightly. The algebra doesn't change with respect to its vector space structure, but the uh, multiplication and behaviors changes. And now to connect it with yesterday's monoidal categories, uh, I claim that temporally leap delta is not only a category, but it is a, it is a strict k-linear monoidal category. So I have to give uh, the data of a tensor product. And the tensor product in this case is really easy. The tensor product is just, let me write it in words, putting uh, dots and diagrams next to each other. So here is the picture. If I have either dots or diagram, and then again, dots respectively diagrams. So I tensor them together by just putting them next to each other. And here's a specific example, which hopefully shows what's going on. So if for instance, I tensor two dots, which means uh, object two and the object three, then I get uh, the object five. So I take two dots and three dots and put them next to each other, I get five dots. Or if I take this diagram like this, for instance, and I tensor with that one, then I get the diagram, which looks like this. So it's really just stupidly putting them next to each other. Okay, and then I have to give a, a unit. And the unit is just the object zero, which in terms of dots is just no point. So, so we, don't, we don't change anything. And the, so this is no dot. And we have, of course, zero, tensor zero is equal to zero plus zero. So no, no point next to no point is of course no point. So we get zero. <laughs> um, and it's strict. So that means the associator map is the identity. Uh, and so we have the full data. Okay. So, and just to give you a little bit an overview, there are many disguises of this. Uh, so maybe I should write this here. There are many disguises of this of this category. So the, by disguises, I mean they they can, for instance, have the same objects. And what I just do, I change the morphism spaces slightly, and it's really only slightly. So for instance, what I could do, I chose these crossingless matchings but I could replace the questionless matchings by permutation diagrams. So from uh, say whatever I have here, I think seven points uh, to whatever seven points, I put permutation diagrams. And of course, if I would have seven points on the bottom and nine points on the top, there's no permutation diagram going between, I would just have the, the uh, zero uh, vector space. So what you get is, is what I might call the, the, code, the category corresponding to the uh, the um, group SN. Of course, this category is a bit stupid in the sense that I have only homomorphisms between A and B if A is equal to B. So I just collect the symmetric groups together, but they don't see each other in, in any reasonable way. But what I could do, which is a bit more interesting, I could say, okay, why, why do I want to have crossingless matchings? I could just take matchings. I could take a, a matching like this, so it would match three points at the bottom with, uh, I think, seven points at the, at the top. And if you do this, uh, then you can get a category defined in the same way as before, with the composition by stacking and replacing uh, internal circles by a, a value delta. What you get is called the power category. So it, it was introduced in terms of algebras by power. And then I think by Lehrer and Chang really studied the first time seriously uh, just, just a, a few years ago. Or you can, you can do something like uh, 
taking partitions. So, so I take these two dots at the bottom, three dots at, three dots at the top, and I just partition these dots into subsets. And again, I can stack them on top of each other. And if I have connected components in the middle, I remove them via parameter data. And this is what is called the partition category. Or something which uh, appears in topology is uh, you can take the morphism spaces to be braid diagrams, uh, model of the braid relations, which we saw also on Sunday. So for instance, something like this is a braid. So it's the same thing as a permutation diagram, except that you somehow remember which strand is overcrossing and which is undercrossing. So again, uh, the endomorphisms, uh, sorry, why did I write endomorphisms? Homomorphisms, the homomorphisms uh, between A and B are only non-trivial if A is equal to B. And in this case, you just get the group algebra of the break. So you just collect the group algebras of the break groups together. And somehow it's again a bit boring because they don't interact. So to make them interact, um, you can somehow combine the braid group stuff with the Brouwer stuff, the matching of points by saying I have to match the point. But if the strands cross, I still have to remember whether I go up over it or below it. So these are then pictures like this. Uh, and then you take these diagrams model or isotopies. There's a long list of isotopies, including, for instance, these Weidemeister moves, which we saw, which we saw, I think, also on, on, on Sunday. Uh, so what you get then is a category which is called the tangle category. So if you are interested in this, you can look, for instance, in Castle's book on quantum groups, where he gives a complete list of relations for that. And so these guys appear, for instance, when you want to want to do knots here. Okay. And now let me mention two other things where you do more or less the same, but you change slightly the objects. So before we just had objects, natural numbers, which we saw as points. And now I want to have the objects as points, but I have two kinds of points, a point which has a head and a point which has is down. So an up point and a down point. So I just take uh, finite sequences of dots with this marking. And the sequences might also be empty, uh, which was the same thing as before the zero object. And then I can take morphisms between them. So the first, the first example I want to do is I take morphisms which are just matchings of these points. So I have some points at the bottom. So I only, I, I only drew the, the heads, the markings, but I should also draw the points. Uh, so you have these dots at the bottom and the dots at the top, and you just connect them uh, via some matching. The only thing which you have to remember, uh, you have to um, connect them so that these uh, markings induce an orientation on the strand. So for instance, here, I gave you an example where this strand is, has a marking up on the top and a marking down at the bottom. So this is not an oriented strand. It doesn't induce an orientation. So this is bad. Or here, I have a marking up and I go over there, I have still a marking up. So this is not a reasonable orientation. So this is not allowed. This guy is not allowed. But this guy, if you look carefully, every strand has a well-defined orientation. And so this guy would be allowed. And uh, so you can again compose these things, you give internal circles a value. And this is what uh, some people call either world power category, going back to Turaev and Koike, who defined originally the power algebra, the world power algebra, uh, or uh, oriented power category by the obvious reason, that it's orientations uh, put on these power diagrams, which we have above. And then of course you can do the same thing uh, also, again, by remembering the over and under crossing. So what you get is oriented tangle diagrams. And I didn't draw the <laughs> correct tangle diagram. That's the whole point. Uh, so I have to remember uh, the over and under crossing. So for instance, like this. Yeah. So there's lots of these examples. And for people who know what the uh, quantizations are, you can also put some quantum parameters in these relations, et cetera, uh, make it more complicated. Uh, but the principal idea is always the same, the same thing. Okay, right. So now the proposition two is the analog of proposition one. All the above examples are strict monoidal categories.
and uh, just exactly as before. Okay. And so let me let me give a remark. So very often it's pretty cumbersome to to write down really a basis of these home spaces. So we would really say uh, something like this category is generated by something. And so you can say the categories uh, in part one. So this, this in part one was the ones where I had uh, just points as objects and can also be defined in terms of generators and relations. Uh, so they can be defined as the uh, monoidal category. generated by one object, which is just a dot. So I have this dot and generated as a monoidal category means I, I can do tensor products. So I can take tensor products of this dot, including the zero tensor product. So I can either have a tensor product of a dot with itself, which is two dots or three dots, etc., or I can get the empty tensor product, which is no dot. So in this way, I can create all the objects and then by morphisms, so I tell you what the morphisms are, which generate this. So let me do just a few examples uh, for temporary leap. I just need two morphisms, cup and cap. And I claim every cross-singlet matching you can create by putting cups and caps either uh, horizontally next to each other or on top of each other, maybe including some identities. And this means I generate them as a tensor category. And then of course, for the symmetric groups uh, category, okay, okay. Uh, it's enough to just take one crossing because the all permutation diagrams you can put, you can create by putting one crossing somewhere, maybe identities next to each other and then compose them horizontally or vertically. And then for this power category, which was, uh, which was, um, not necessarily crossingless matchings, but arbitrary, arbitrary matchings. I can take the, the crossing and a cup and a cap. So it's a mix of these two guys. And let me, let me uh, mention the partition algebra. There I have this crossing again and one, one more generator. Uh, for braids, you have like for the symmetric group, except that you have to distinguish the crossings. And then finally for tangles, you have the crossings and the cup and the cap. So that means in, in practice, it is much easier to write them as a basis. And uh, then of course we have to say, what are relations? So let me, let me list here the relations, the defining relations. So for the temporal leverage, but the only relations you need to know is that the circle, an internal circle should get the value delta. And then I, I will have, want to have the nice snake relations, both of them. So that means the snake plus my evaluation at delta determines over the everything. And then for the symmetric group, I, of course I want to have the symmetric group relations, which I don't want to draw. And then for the power algebra of power category, uh, I, I have a bit more relations, the SN relations. Uh, then I have uh, something which should remind you on the first writing my morph. If I have a crossing and a, and a cap on top of it, uh, if you just look at it as a matching, it's the same thing as just putting the cap, um, which is the same thing as No, yeah, and I want to have the upside down version as well for the cup. Then I want to want to have the uh, circle is equal to delta as before. I want to have the snakes as before. Sorry, this is the identity, which is somehow this, which disappeared. Yeah, this is an identity. And one extra move, which is like this light move like this. So these are the relations for this power category. So I, I maybe don't want to write the other ones. It's, it's too much anyway. Um, just to 
to answer a question which, uh, which came yesterday in the question session. Um, so can you write, so I was asked, can you write down the relation, defining relation for these categories? In, yesterday it was just temporary leap uh, because the person knew the ones for the temporary leap algebra. And so I want to do this now for the power category. So I gave you here the generators and the relations for the power category viewed as a monoidal category. And now, just as a comparison, if I take the power algebra for fixed element A, then I have these type of relations. So first symmetric group relations, some idempotent relation, commutativity relations, etc. And so I, I find these relations pretty, pretty ugly and also pretty long because I have to draw all these tons of, of strands, etc. So what I would like to do I just would like to uh, somehow say, I don't want to answer this question anymore of talking about relations in the algebra. I want to cross them out <laughs> because you should not think about algebras anymore. You should really think about the category because I would say these relations here fit into this small corner and are much nicer. And maybe for the expert who know also quantizations of power categories, uh, some of the admissibility conditions just disappear if you think in terms of categories. And so I really want to convince you that you should forget about thinking about the algebra. <laughs> okay, good. Right, so now, uh, let me do a few, a free, few remarks. So I just gave you the, the answer of generators and relation, and it's usually, it's usually, uh, non-trivial to find all relations. So, so if, if we do it in a way how I did it, I define the temporal leap category in terms of morphism spaces being certain vector spaces with a basis. And then I said, I want to have generators and relations. And usually it's, it's highly non-trivial to find all the relations. Or uh, in the case you have relations, Um, to show that these are all. All you need to really define, define your category. You might just miss some of them. In particular, when you need more, many, then you might miss some. Okay, and often representation theory is very useful to show that you might have uh, relations forgotten or to show that you have enough by acting with your stuff on subject. Um, and the second remark I want to make, one might formulate these categories which I have upstairs, uh, the up above categories, actually as two categories. So where the objects are, maybe I, I should not say too much about it, the objects are before, as before, and the morphisms so for instance, uh, here, I said, I take tangle diagrams or I take braid diagrams, model of braid relations. So I could say I take morphisms, which are just the braid diagrams without any relations. And then I, I say, I put two morphisms, which then uh, express the relations, the braid relations or the isotopic relations as two morphisms. So this is often done and we will see this a little bit later, uh, I guess. I just wanted to mention it briefly here. Okay, so now uh, why do we care? Why do we care about these categories? And so there are many reasons for this. Uh, I mean, they are just beautiful and they are combinatorially nice, uh, etc. But what I want to emphasize today is a very specific aspect of them. Uh, namely, there are um, certain universal categories. Uh, and not only categories, universal monoidal categories. So this is what I, I want to emphasize. Uh, and they depend on delta. Right. So, and, and the idea of dependence on delta is something, it's something cute. So for instance, uh, 
when I when I have something like a, 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 a group GLN or something, then n might vary. And so I would like to understand stuff like GLN for varying n or varying parameter by looking at such categories which have a parameter built in. And I, I, I want to vary this parameter to understand other things which depend on the parameter. So now to make this precise, I want to fix a monoidal category. And I first have to introduce a few notions about monoidal categories, which we haven't done uh, yesterday. So I, I abbreviate monoidal categories now just to see what I mean uh, that I have this data of a quintuple as, as I introduced yesterday. Okay, so now the first definition I need is the definition of monoidal, uh, of, of dual objects. So that V be a, an object in C, then a left dual, a left dual of V is by definition an object, which I call V dual, um, together with two maps. So together with morphisms in my category, um, which I call evaluation respectively co-evaluation, evaluation respectively co-evaluation. Is that how I call them? Uh, so the first map goes from the dual tensor the original thing to one. So to get an idea, uh, just think of in terms of the category of vector spaces. If I take a vector space V, I take the dual vector space. Uh, then I have a map going to the one dimensional vector space, which is this one here, which just take the, takes a function and a vector and evaluates this function at this vector. So when I, I denote this map uh, almost in the same way as this temporal leap diagrams, but I put in uh, some more labeling here. So it, it, it goes from V, v star tensor V uh, and it, it ends up in, in somehow nothing. And vice versa, I want to have a map, which is called the co-evaluation going from one to V tensor V dual. And I draw this like that. Okay. And they should have some uh, coherence property. So what they, I want to have such that if I start from V, then I identify this with one tensor V. So in terms of vector spaces, I just tensor with the one dimension vector space. So nothing happens really. So then I take this map, this co-evaluation going to V tensor V dual and take the identity on, on the next guy. So I end up in V tensor V dual uh, tensor V. And then I take my associator, A, which allows me to put the bracket in a different way. I go like this. And now I have V dual tensor V, uh, which is in the correct order of this map. So that means I can apply here my cap. And I end up in V tensor uh, one. So I should apply uh, identity in the front and then the cap on the other two factors. So identity tensor. And then I, again, identify this with V. So this identification, which I think are obvious in, in the category of vector spaces. So these identifications, uh, they come from, uh, they come from these uh, equivalences, which we had as a, in the definition uh, of monoidal category, uh, tensoring with one is an equivalence and tensoring with one from the other side is also an equivalence. I don't want to explain this in too much detail, but uh, having these, you get natural isomorphisms there. Okay, and the statement is, this composite is the identity map. Okay, so and, and just, to make sure that you that you can remember this, uh, because it's a, such a complicated thing, uh, I draw a picture. So I start with V. Here's my V, and then and then I do uh, the cup and the identity like this. Then I do some associator, which I maybe just draw like a little swivel in, in between, and then I I do my cap there, 
And what I want to get is the identity on V. So again, you have some sort of uh, snake relation, which is put into the definition or which defines for you this B2. And of course, uh, there's also a right version. There is the notion of right dual. You just do the same thing, except uh, uh, you put the star on the other side uh, and then you have maps from V tensor V star to one and from one to uh, V star tensor V. So it's just the opposite order to before. And you have the same sort of conditions. There's also the notion. Yeah, similar, it's just a similar, exactly the similar uh, definition. Okay, so as an exercise, you can show, you can show the category of vector spaces. Uh, there exist duals in the category of vector spaces, finite dimension, sorry, finite dimensional vector spaces of finite dimensional vector spaces, you can also do something more fancy and take finite dimension super vector spaces. So that means two set two graded vector spaces. Or you can take the category web G for G a finite group or G an algebraic group, or you can take web G for G a semi-simple Lie algebra. So I mean finite dimensional representation of a semi-simple Lie algebra. You can, if you want, do something a bit more fancy you can take the universal enveloping algebra or the quantized universal enveloping algebra. So all these are examples where we have tools. Uh, and in fact, the left and the right dual are isomorphic. And so what you can try to find is examples where the left dual is not uh, isomorphic to the right tool. And I, I think this is not completely trivial. And if you find some, I would be interested to see them because I don't have many such examples. So, and, and a remark is, which explains a little bit why there are so not so many cases where the left and the right dual are not uh, isomorphic is, if C is, is a symmetric monolithic category, so what, by this I mean, there exists uh, natural isomorphisms, uh, say S, V, W, uh, for any V and W, when I tensor them together to the corresponding swapped tensor product. Uh, so maybe call them cross like this, uh, satisfying the relations of the symmetric group. So that means if I if I go from V tensor W to W tensor V uh, and then go back via the corresponding map for W tensor V, then it should be the identity. And then I want to have the normal braid relation somehow in the symmetric group of the symmetric group. So if I have this, uh, then uh, left tools are isomorphic to right tools. And the isomorphism is just given by this symmetry. And this is, I mean, often the, it's a case that we have a symmetric monoidal category, for instance, category of vector spaces, finite dimensional vector spaces is of this type. And therefore, uh, you don't have to distinguish between left and right. Okay, now let's assume uh, C is monoidal and symmetric. And let's also assume that the endomorphism algebra of the one object is just K. So by sending lambda and K to lambda times the identity. Right. Okay. Then I define a Im very important notion. Then I say, uh, so assume a V has uh, left dual, and I can, don't have to distinguish because I have symmetric monoidal, so it could also be a, a right dual. And let's say F is an endomorphism in my category. 
So then I define the so-called categorical trace. So this is a very abstract nonsense in monoidal categories, uh, generalizing the normal trace of from finite dimensional, uh, from linear algebra. So what do I do? I take, I define the trace of F as the following thing. I start from my unit. I take my co-evaluation co map uh, going from V, from the unit to V tensor V dual. Then I can apply my endomorphism on the first factor and do nothing on the second. So I just end up in here. Then I can swap the two guys. And then I can evaluate and I'm back to one. So in, in pictures, it would look roughly like I take co-evaluation, I take the map F here. I take evaluation. Uh, no, I should swap in between. I should swap in between. I take evaluation. And so here is uh, V and here's V dual. And so this gives a map from one to one and one uh, endomorphism from one is just K. So I can say that this guy is an element in actually K. So it's a, it's a scalar. And so this scalar is called a categorical trace and the dimension of this object V is defined as the categorical trace of the identity map on V. And so if you think of in terms of linear algebra, if I have a finite dimensional vector space and I take the trace of the identity, this is of course giving me the dimension of my finite dimensional vector space. And I, I just mimic this in this abstract nonsense. So this generalizes, so this generalizes traces and dimensions from linear algebra. And it has the property that if I take the dimension of V tensor W, then it's a dimension of V multiplied with the dimension of W. So, and this is the one thing which we wanted to have, for instance, yesterday, we wanted to see a multiplication in the natural numbers. But what is different here now, it might be not, this dimension might be not, maybe I should write this, the warning, the dimension could be any number or any element in K, a priori. Of course, it depends on your category, but uh, in general, there you will find for any element in K, a category which has a, an object of this dimension. So it doesn't need to be a natural number. And so for instance, dimension zero, having dimension zero is something very interesting. So usually you, you would think dimension zero means I have a zero vector space or something, uh, but in, in abstract tensor categories, objects of dimension zero are very important. So for people who know for instance, tilting modules, uh, quantum dimension zero is something important. And another example, uh, for instance, the dimension of a superspace so a superspace is just a set two graded vector space. Uh, it's just the dimension of the uh, degree zero part plus the dimension of the degree one part. No, wrong, that's the whole point. Minus the dimension of the degree one part. So in particular, the super dimension can be something negative, which is maybe counterintuitive when you see it the first time. Okay, now, uh, what, is the, what is the point of this dimension? So here's the theorem, which uh, is due to the lean, but I write this little arrow because he might not have written it, or he definitely hasn't written it in this way, um, but it is due to the lean. Um, so assume C is a symmetric monoidal category. Just take your favorite one. If, if you want to take finite dimension vector spaces, that's fine. And I want to assume there uh, that I have an object, which is self-dual. So self-dual just means the dual, right or left dual is isomorphic to itself, to V. And I want to have that the dimension of V is delta. So this is in K. So you can take a super vector space to, to get a negative number, or you can take a finite dimension vector space and then, then this dimension is the normal dimension. 
uh, you get a positive number or non-negative non number. And then the statement is, there exists a unique monoidal functor. So that means a unique functor, which preserves somehow the tensor product. So it commutes with the tensor product. F, which goes from this power category, which we defined before, to C. So in some sense, uh, this power category is a universal monoidal category, goes to any category, where I just have to specify one object with its dimension and say this is self dual That's the only thing I have to do. And uh, how does this work? So this power category has one object in S generator, which is a dot, and this generator is just sent to V. And so if I have five dots, then five dots are sent to five-fold tensor product of V. And this crossing, which is, uh, uh, which is one of these uh, matchings in, in, the, in the morphisms, uh, this is just mapped to this uh, S, which is inside, which is defining the symmetric monoidal structure. Uh, yeah. And then I have the cup, no cap, the cap is going to the following. So the cap is a, uh, it's supposed to be a map from V tensor V uh, to, to nothing on the other side. So what I do is I start with V and V, then I identify V with V dual. This is what my assumption allows me. And here I just take the identity and then I can take here the co-evaluation. And I uh, have a morphism going from V tensor V to nothing, which is, so I maybe should have said, so, so the, the empty set is going to uh, just the unit element. And here's the unit element. And then the cup is just going to uh, the guy where I have V and V dual here. And then I identify this with V and so this might matter. And I can, I can have a second version uh, namely, I can just assume I have an object, but it's not necessarily self dual, uh, but it has a dual, left or right dual, whatever you prefer. V dual, uh, with dimension delta. Then there exists a monoidal functor, uniquely determined. from this world power category, where I had uh, two types of objects, of generating objects, namely this funny guys with a marker down or this funny dot with a marker up. And so I just sent them to V respectively to V2. And again, uh, putting such guys next to each other means on the other side, because I have a monoidal functor means I tensor them together. And then I, I should say, uh, where does the crossing go to? So crossing, um, so in this, in this vault power stuff, uh, I have these batchings, but they have to be compatible with these markers. So they have to induce an orientation. So I can, for instance, look at such a thing. And this goes to uh, the S, this map S in this magic model structure, depending on V. And then I can change the orientation. So if I, I just put this in, in color in packets, I could, for instance, swap this. And swapping this means I should take a dual here or swapping the other one just means I put a dual here. And then, and, and then the, uh, the cup and the cap as before. But you put a right dual? Ah. So I, I always, um, here I always put a left tool. And uh, with cups okay, and the position of the star made it seem like it was on the other side. Got it. It should be left. Oh, oh. no, it should be right. The star should be right. And I take a left tool. This is always confusing for me. You are right. 
<laughs> so the star should be on the right. You are right. <laughs> okay. So so that means that means this this. Uh, Diagram categories are in have this universal property, and I just did it for this power and this word power. But all the other ones also can be formulated in terms of universal properties. You might have to change symmetric monoidal by braided monoidal, but it works similarly. Okay, so now let me let me do a, a examples. Can I ask you a quick a quick question? Sure. In this theorem, do you ask the category to be strict? Or do you drop that? Like the isn't the Brouwer category strict? This uh, what is it, happening it's, with the function? It's strict. Um, you don't have to ask it to be strict. Um, you don't have to. Um, but if you want to, I can assume it. Does it like force? Does the functor sort of force it to be strict? Yes. Yes, one has to. Let me assume strict. So, so it forces it in the with the correct definitions, but but uh, yeah, this is a bit technical. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I I don't want to say too much about this. Um, okay, so let's let's first look at um, at the category C, which is representations of the orthogonal group O M, or representations of the symplectic group. So why do I want to look at this? Because when I take the natural, the natural representation of this, um, then this is isomorphic to its dual as a vector space, um, because I have a pairing uh, for the orthogonal group, I have a symmetric pairing, and for the symplectic group, I have a symplectic form, a screw symmetric form. Um, so I, I can take this and it's self-dual. So this is self-dual, also in this categorical sense. And I want to set delta equals to m, respectively, uh, delta equals to 2 in these two cases. And so, so this gives an example of such a category. Okay, in this case, I don't have strict. <laughs> it's, a, it's a symmetric monoidal category uh, with a self-dual object. And the dimension is, is this delta. So I have a functor. And uh, so I could ask the question, how much does does me this category here tell me about the representation theory of the orthogonal lens of black group? And so I mentioned at the beginning, this delta varies between semi-simple or not semi-simple situations. And of course, uh, representations of a finite group, like the orthogonal or black group, they are always semi-simple if I've, I'm working over complex numbers. So over C. So, but what I can do is I can do a fancy thing. I can take a combination of both. And create something which is not semi simple, which is highly interesting. So I can consider a super vector space. So that's just a Z2 graded vector space, like this. So let's say the first one is C to the M, uh, the degree zero part, and the degree one part is 2N dimensional. And I want to fix a non-degenerate non bilinear form on this V. And so I want to do it such that it combines the two situations from before. So I want to have that beta restricted to the even part is uh, symmetric like in the orthogonal group case, okay. and beta restricted to the odd part is skew symmetric. And beta restricted to the mixed of the two things is zero. So this is so called a supersomatic non-degenerate bilinear form. And then I can ask question, what is the group G of all elements A in GLV, the general linear group, such that A preserves beta, like, like for the orthogonal or symplectic group. 
Or if you want, I can take the Lie algebra. So these are all A in endomorphisms of V, C linear endomorphisms. So V is a, a set two graded vector space. So C linear endomorphisms uh, inherit a set two grading. So I want to take a map which is homogeneous. So it's either sends the degree zero to the degree zero and degree one to degree one, or it swaps them. Um, so, and then I, I want to have uh, the preserving means that beta of A X times Y uh, is it uh, plus beta of X A Y should be zero. So for those of you who know orthogonal and black Lie algebras, you define them usually in this way. The only thing what I do now is I sneak in a little sign, minus one to the degree of A, which is either zero if it preserves the degree or one if it doesn't preserve the degree, times the degree of this vector X. So everything is set two grades. So this is just a generalization of, of orthogonal and symplectic groups glued together. And we can look at now at representations of this G. Or if you want of the Lie algebra, it's the same thing. Finite dimensional representations. So this is this is often called the also symplectic group. Also symplectic group. Supergroup. OSP M to N. So I match, I somehow put O and S P together. And then I take look at this category, and I can take with V the natural representation. Just the, the representation which I which I had upstairs. Okay. Um, so then is the uh, this is a this is an example of this uh, of this setup in one. And let me just state the theorem which gives you as an application of this universal property of, of these categories, the following thing. So this is a theorem I proved with John Bunden, um, but it is built on work of, of Combs and Wilson. So what can I do now? I can ask the question uh, given uh, given V tensor R, what are the indecomposable summons of this thing? So and if you if you know, for instance, representations here of the general linear group, mm -hmm. you know that decomposing tensor products of the natural representation has lots to do with combinatorics of uh, of um, symmetric functions and uh, Klebsch Gordon coefficients or Littlewood Richardson coefficients, etc. And now I make it much more complicated. I, I, I want to, to study the orthogonal and the symplectic group together. And I have examples where, uh, for instance, this delta, this delta here, ah, I didn't write what delta is. So delta in this case, I want to take to be uh, the dimension of zero part minus the dimension of the one part. So it could happen that I have a super vector space where the degree zero part and degree one part is the same, has the same dimension. So this delta becomes zero. So I expect something which behaves like this temporary leap for zero. So maybe something non semi simple. And, uh, and so in general, uh, the bad thing here, this is, uh, in general, not semi-simple. So, so really indecomposables are not the same thing as irreducibles. And so here's the theorem, which I just want to state. Uh, so the indecomposable summons uh, ah. No, I wrote it. I wrote it wrongly. I should not write Bunden. <laughs> Sorry, I should write here Eric. I did this wrongly, and I should write here Combs and Heider stuff. 
So now, the indecomposable summons in such a tensor space has a very nice combinatorial descriptions. They are in bijection to so-called MN cross partitions. of something. Ah. ah, sorry, I do it totally wrongly. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I have to start again. <laughs> I have to start again. I mix up two cases. I want to be quick. Uh, so I need one minute. Uh, so I want to decompose these guys. And I also want to uh, decompose. Uh, hmm. OK. So this builds on uh, Combs and Heider stuff. And let me just make it very quick because I'm over time already. So what we what we do, we classify in the composable summons. And what we use, um, what we use is, is the following. Uh, there exists an equivalence of monoidal categories between this category power delta and on the other side, web OSP for this M to N and delta is equal to M minus two N modulo some certain tensor ID. So, so that uh, uh, we have a functor, a universal functor from this power delta to web stations of this thing by just sending a, a dot to V and these other maps to the corresponding maps. And the statement is we can describe explicitly what this tensor ideal is. So this can be described explicitly. And using that, uh, one, can, one can study this power category uh, to get information about this web station category. So in particular, at the end, what we have is a, is a decomposition of these tensor products uh, like this in terms of diagrams and uh, properties of this power category. So the only thing which I have to take uh, as a technical tool is because I want to take here summons, I should take here the Karub enclosure. So this is the Karub enclosure which means I pass to the, I add formally direct summons. So and I'm already, sorry, I'm already over time. Uh, so so why, why I was a bit mixed up at the, at the end, uh, I should just say a, a general, a, a, an analog uh, of this example also works in the case of GLN when we have this second, this second example here second case. Uh, in this case, we can take GLN and then uh, we can take here the corresponding supergroup for GLN. And then instead of taking V tensor R, we can take a mixed tensor product of V and V dual. And then we have really nice combinatorics uh, related to sure functions and symmetric functions. Et cetera. Yeah, sorry for, the, for this mess at the end. It was a bit too quick, but I sh should stop it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I see there's like one question that was just about convention for, for the trace. So it was, yeah, whether it's just a convention to take the trace first mapping to be parts of dual instead of the other way around. Ah, whether you choose the left or the right dual. Yeah. That's a, that's a convention and, and at the end the, the trace is the same thing. And anyway, in, in all these symmetric monoidal categories, V is isomorphic to, V the left tool is isomorphic to the right tool, and then it's anyway the same thing. And so even think, when yeah. ratings, it's also, it's also the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other question or comment? I think I have a question. I'm not sure how the question is yet. But so is uh, the, your theorem, the, the Ling theorem has two parts, right? So it has the part where you have the self-dual 
yes uh, element yes. and the other part and so is there any way that if you look at the representations of the super lee algebras for example you can you can sort of get the second part of the theorem i mean getting this situation from this situation yes <laughs> Am I making all the all the tricky questions today? I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I, I, I find this very interesting because because okay. So, on the level of of power categories, you can actually embed this guy into that guy. Mm -hmm. And so I would say uh, you you might want to go the opposite direction. You want to get this out of that. Mm. And this is how actually. Uh, things, uh, how we prove things and how many other people prove things. So to think of this power stuff as being like a folding of the other stuff. So like mm -hmm. the orthogonal Lawson awesome black group is a fixed point subgroup inside the GLN group. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say one should first prove this or look at this, which is in fact much, much easier. <laughs> also, it looks here much more complicated because I have V and V dual. But the combinatorics is much easier and it's it's more like type A, or it is type A. Whereas this thing is really not type A. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to to because you you have a background on castanistic polynomials, um, to to understand what these summons are, they are not indecomposable, uh, they are not irreducible, but indecomposable. If you want to know the, the Jordan Helder series, you get multiplicities and they are given by custom lustic polynomials, parabolic custom lustic polynomials of type B, C, or D, actually type, uh, I would say type B, um, which are much harder than type A. So, so I, would, I would say one should go <laughs> in this direction. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Um, could I ask a question about um, your application, the theorem yeah. of yourself and Eric? Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if um, for, I mean, uh, for arbitrary M and N, are all those cases equally uh, easy or hard? Or is it sometimes easier when M is bigger or N is smaller or M is odd or M is even? Yes. So what is definitely much, much easier is if M is odd. And the main reason for this is if M is odd, then the orthogonal or OSP group is isomorphic to the special orthogonal group. And, and this is bet, it's better behaved. But in general, you should forget about the special orthogonal group because the combinatorics is really bad. But uh, in general, for even M, there is many more extensions between uh, irreducible modules than you would like to have. And this is pretty hard to, to somehow uh, con to control. And somehow this theorem looks pretty easy, but to describe this tensor ideal, we have to work very hard. And we, for people who know KLR algebras, what we have to use is some sort of BCD type version of KLR algebras. And these BCT type versions of KLR algebras, they were introduced of, of power uh, algebra, power categories. They were introduced by Ge Li and later also by uh, Webster, Zhang, and uh, Bao and Wang. Uh, and in this four paper, uh, author's paper, they only do the case where you can deal with odd M and not with even M. And so the whole other family they leave out. And, and so, uh, yeah, this is pretty hard, but this Geli, Geli version uh, allows us to do also the even amps. One just has to work hard on. And does M equals to two N also degenerate in some way, or that's actually the same difficulty as arbitrary so this is the, So what is, what is, I think, easier is if one of them is very small, then it's easier. But whether you are really the same or whether you are a little bit off, this is the same difficulty. Thanks very much. That's very interesting. And I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but so also, Monica briefly mentioned branching. So you can ask the question how things behave when you tensor with V and V dual. Uh, and so in the odd case, 
uh, things behave very nicely, more or less roughly like a type A, except that you have to add boxes and remove boxes. In the even case, it's harder. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Any other comment or question? It does not seem to be the case. So first, let us thank Katarina again.